This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and practicing in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I cannot believe this is my 20th podcast. When I took a course on podcasting last August, I was told that the average number of podcasts that someone does is eight. So I am well, well above the average. And a lot of that is thanks to you. I've been receiving so much feedback, emails, comments, subscribers, So thank you very much for letting me know. And there are those of you out there who are enjoying it. Today, we're going to be talking about vulnerability. Now, the definition of vulnerability is being able to be hurt or having a sensitivity. It's not the same as being scared or admitting defeat, which I think is often confused, actually. In fact, in my estimation, accepting vulnerability is actually a strength. Why is that? Because when you accept them, when you know what they are, when you understand them, you can get really good at recognizing when those vulnerabilities are skewing your thinking or your choices. But it takes being honest about them with yourself. That's what it takes. And perhaps even with others. We're going to talk a little bit about how knowing what your vulnerabilities are, especially important in mental illness. What are the gifts of vulnerability? How are your vulnerabilities created? Vulnerability is a hard word to say. (laughs) Oh, goodness. And a question I'd like to ask is, what is the flip side of vulnerability? And then lastly, I'm going to read an email from a listener. So many of my emails are about the topic of perfectly hidden depression, which I've written about on my blog. And actually, there are two podcasts on it, three and four. It's depression that people keep as the name implies, perfectly hidden. And the writer of the email talked about discovering her own vulnerability of having a diagnosis of PTSD. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So today, our focus is on vulnerability. Brene Brown, who has done incredible research and has written wonderful books on imperfection and vulnerability, writes, Owning our own story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy, the experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. Beautifully, beautifully put. She writes about vulnerability's power, about the fact that it can be such a positive in your life because it can lead to greater connection. I think it's also important to realize that the understanding of where you're vulnerable can make you stronger if you accept it and work with it. Let's talk a little bit about how this is important in mental illness. Bipolar disorder often, although it is cyclic and has a strong genetic predisposition for its symptoms, there are triggers that can trigger a manic episode or trigger a depressed episode. Those are your vulnerabilities. You need to get to know your triggers so that you can better manage your bipolar disorder. Certainly with depression, There are triggers. There are vulnerabilities to depression. You tend to get sad at certain times of the year, for example, or there's certain emotions that are harder for you to handle. Anxiety is the same. Certain situations where you are vulnerable to anxiety. And so recognizing when you can predict these things or when they are present really helps you manage your own mental illness. Now, in a more generic way, we all have vulnerabilities. We have specific fears, fear of getting sick, not having enough money, a fear of heights. Others are more general, feeling socially awkward, not being able to express emotion very well, struggling with organization like people with ADD. Yet many people fear exposing their struggles 
because they believe that that admission marks them as less than, as inferior. And of course, there is risk in being open. There might be somebody who thinks less of me because I have panic disorder. I don't know. That's not under my control. But I know that it does me good as an individual and in connection with other people to admit whatever my vulnerabilities are as a person. So let me tell you a story about me at least trying to talk about vulnerability. I was giving a talk to a bunch of social media bloggers, and the topic of the talk was what kind of struggles might you have personally when you begin to expose your life on social media. So I started out this story by saying that I had decided from the get-go not to advertise on my website. It was just something I didn't want to do. I couldn't see a advertisement popping up when I was talking about such serious things as suicidal ideation or divorce or rape or whatever. But I had gotten this invitation to join the Blogger Publishing Network, and they wanted me to become a member. And of course, I have this vulnerability of wanting to feel like I fit in. And I heard this voice all of a sudden in my head saying, well, maybe I could advertise a little. I mean, what's the harm in that? And it was my old nemesis, my mental bad habit that was getting me in trouble. As soon as I recognized that this was the part of me that was really struggling, wanting to fit in, wanting to please, my anxiety vanished. I knew how my thinking was getting so distorted. So I was talking to this audience about if anyone else would like to share their anxieties or what perhaps had been exposed by them being a blogger. And some questions were asked and a very good discussion followed, but no one really talked about something more sensitive, more tender, until the talk was over. And then people sought me out privately. They had tears in their eyes when they were admitting some of their own fears, just some of their own hang-ups. And my husband was there, and I asked him later if there had been another way perhaps I could have encouraged folks to talk more openly. And he said, Margaret, people aren't comfortable talking about themselves. You're, you're just used to doing it. And I, I felt stupid. I felt, I felt like a, what was another, a dingbat. <laughs> because I know that about people. I know that it is very difficult to reveal what you feel like perhaps people will ridicule or make fun of you about, what you're sensitive about. Yet I watch people fight fear every day. And what I learn from them is what is more important is self-acceptance. Whatever kind of secrets that they're afraid to share, it's important that they know and address whatever shame they have about it. Now, perhaps what is an obvious point is how our vulnerabilities are created as children. They're created just the same way our strengths are. You get to know and discover what you do well as a child. If you have good parents, they help you discover that. And then your vulnerabilities get created as well, perhaps because of just how your personality is being developed, and perhaps you're more shy by nature, or perhaps you have problems that you were born with. But your vulnerabilities can also be created by abuse or by just bad parenting. When you think about it, If you were abused, perhaps it's likely that your vulnerabilities lie in controlling your anger or being overly submissive. If you were adored and very spoiled, your vulnerabilities might range more towards self-centeredness or a lack of empathy or insecurity, actually, because you didn't really earn that adoration, so you can be very insecure. So if you spend some time thinking about whatever hurt or pain you were trying to manage as a child— you'll be able to see your vulnerabilities more clearly. But what is the flip side of vulnerability? What is connected with vulnerability that might actually be very helpful to us? Well, I believe that our strengths and vulnerabilities are intimately connected. In fact, sometimes they can be one and the same. When you think about seeing a rock that's on the ground And maybe it's fairly deeply rooted in the ground, so you really only see one side of the rock. You can walk on it, you can walk around it. That's like your strength. That's the thing that you don't mind people seeing. Your persona, for example. 
It's your wit. It's your mind. It's your emotions. Whatever part of you that you feel is a strong part of your personality. But what we all know is that we really don't know what's on the other side of that rock until we pull it out, right? So there's a dark, mossy, underneath side of that rock, and that's your corresponding vulnerability, what lies beneath the strength. For example, one of my husband's strengths is he's just a very good decision maker. He takes time to make his decisions. I was attracted to him because he was so emotionally stable, right? Well, guess what? Three years into our marriage, I looked at him and said, do you ever make a decision without thinking about it for three or four months? I mean, the vulnerability also lay in the time it took for him to make decisions. And so sometimes he, I I know he's glad I'm telling the world this, (laughs) but sometimes it takes him a while to make decisions. Me, I'm more spontaneous. And of course, what would the corresponding vulnerability be? You know, at times a little impulsive. Certainly, Brene Brown, in the opening quote, talks about the importance of connection through vulnerability and that really it is only that connection with others that allows us to have deeper, more intimate relationships. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I treated a man three, four years ago now. He had a severe bipolar disorder. Actually, he got psychotic. And in our treatment, We certainly found out that he had managed through the years to avoid all kinds of more sensitive emotions. He was a doer. He was very successful, but he definitely stayed away from any kind of sadness or fatigue that he might feel. He just said to me in a more recent session, you know, if you've taught me one thing, you've taught me that being vulnerable is okay. And in fact, it's important and a way to connect. So I also think there are specific gifts of vulnerability. When you know them, when you understand them, you can actually protect them. And if someone else tries to manipulate them, you'll be prepared because you'll know, oh, I tend to get pulled in by compliments. I tend to be jealous. If you tend to be sensitive to criticism and you are attracted to someone who's an abusive person, Obviously, they're going to try to manipulate that sensitivity, and you'll absorb the criticism. If you know you tend to do that, then you'll perhaps be more likely to recognize it. Another gift of vulnerability is when you know and trust that your partner understands what you struggle with, and you understand his or hers. That can be very powerful and make a deep connection between two people. I was listening to a story recently where a woman had been extremely interested in a guy and he'd had a horrible trauma in his childhood. And when she would bring it up, he would just say, well, I I don't want to talk about that. It was as if being seen as being more vulnerable or talking about something really devastating was something that he could not do. She had not really paid much attention to that at the time, but now their relationship has ended, and she's beginning to recognize that some of the reason was his inability to actually process pain or reveal vulnerability. The third gift is when you accept your vulnerabilities, you're no longer afraid of their exposure. When you find people that you trust and that you tell, they will support you in that vulnerability And you can give them the same gift. You can understand the origins of whatever you struggle with and can have compassion for yourself now and as a child. And then the fourth gift is that your vulnerabilities point you to your strengths. They are really married to one another and are intimately connected. You simply don't get one without the other. I'd like to recommend to you Dr. Brene Brown's work, Three of her books are called The Gifts of Imperfection, The Power of Vulnerability, and Daring Greatly. They're really wonderful resources for this topic, and I'll have links to them in the show notes. So let's get to today's email. It's a little longer than normal. And it's on perfectly hidden depression. 
Dr. Rutherford, I'm not really sure what has led me to email you. The part of me who is a student preparing to enter a PsyD program in the fall is very interested in your work in shining light on something like perfectly hidden depression. The other part of me relates to it, so it almost hurts. I've read your articles on the mighty before and thought, wow, sounds like me. But no, it's not me. I can't enter into a helping field if I'm not 100% mentally healthy. As a crisis counselor currently, I cannot tell you how many times since reading your articles I was able to validate the experiences of others and tell them that what they're going through is so incredibly real and that they can live a blessed and grateful life while still having intense feelings. I'm someone always on the go, always trying to be everything to everyone. Not only does it make me feel good to help others, but it keeps me busy so I don't have to focus on my own needs. Recently, I had an injury that required surgery and a pretty lengthy recovery time. I went from 110 miles per hour every day to sitting on a recliner. Luckily, I'm finally able to walk around with a little more ease. Sitting with myself and my thoughts has been such an uncomfortable feeling. They're feelings that I've always felt, but shoved to the back of my head by keeping busy. I've had a PTSD diagnosis for just over a year now, but it's something I've kept completely hidden from everyone and something I haven't taken seriously until now. I would often think to myself, I'm not like the others with PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, the diagnosis was probably a mistake and I don't have it. The things that have happened in my past are nothing compared to what others have gone through. I just need to suck it up. Then she goes on to say in a fairly lengthy paragraph about that she's actually become suicidal on almost a daily basis. And she says, thankfully, I've started to see a therapist who can see right through the persona and doesn't let me, I'm fine, it away. There are things I have yet to talk about and perhaps never will, but she'll always point out my flat affect, that means no emotion, and dig her heels in until we get to the bottom of it. And then she adds, in a parenthesis, she seriously rocks even when I hate her. (laughs) So there are several obviously very important things that this young woman is going through. She has recognized herself in my writing about perfectly hidden depression, which if you're interested in listening is episodes three and four. It's depression that is either unintentionally or intentionally hidden. The unintentional hiding is more about the fact that it's become such a habit to hide how bad you feel that you don't even recognize anymore you're doing it. The intentional one is just what it sounds like, that you know exactly what you're doing. And there are definite characteristics, perfectionism, discounting of pain, counting your blessings as a primary strategy for life, being very interested in others, but no one really knowing you. Again, you can listen to more about that in episode three if you'd like. But here's my answer to this particular email. I'm so glad you reached out to me and I thank you for your kind words. This is a first step. Actually, going into therapy in the first place is probably your first My own struggles with a panic disorder, a history of an eating disorder, and what I call a really bad picker of men. That's not a diagnosis, unfortunately, but I, I didn't have a good picker. I said all of those things during a decade of my life has helped me to be a more compassionate practitioner. I will hope that you have a similar experience. I'm not sure what happened to cause you to have PTSD, but I'm so glad you're revealing it to someone. And good for your therapist not to buy the act. Obviously, You're dealing with some very serious things if your thoughts have led to suicidal ideation, and getting to the bottom of this is vital. I hope you can let go of whatever guilt you feel for simply being human and allow your thinking to expand and change. And I quoted to her something that a supervisor said to me years ago, shame is a helpful emotion if it lasts for 10 seconds and leads to a change of behavior. And I really couldn't believe that more still to this day. I want to thank you again for listening. I hope that perhaps this podcast will help you feel a little more comfortable with your own vulnerability and that you will risk finding people that you can trust 
to begin revealing what you struggle with and listen to them as well. We're all human. We all have struggles. There are lots of ways that you can get in touch with me. I have a website where I blog weekly, and it's drmargaretrutherford.com. You can email me, and I will answer you. It's askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. One of you, and your name is Ian, gave me some great ideas for podcasts. So I would love to hear from any or all of you who might want me to talk about a specific topic. And of course, emails also let me know how you're feeling about the podcast, what you're learning, what you would like to learn, what you don't like, what you do like. That's very helpful to me. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Underscore Margaret as well. And if you've got a few minutes, and it only takes a couple of minutes because I've done it myself, please leave me a rating or a review on iTunes. That's very, very helpful to self-work. And of course, subscribe. More and more of you are doing that, and I'm delighted that you're on board. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.